Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! I'm going to flip a few names for anonymity and to avoid further humiliation of my former roommate. A few years back, shortly after high school, I acquired my first apartment living with two roommates. Most of them I had considered close enough friends to occupy space with. Little did I know that living with people is incredibly complex due to the absolute lack of Fs given during your early 20s. Shortly, I will get to one of the highlights of this hellish roller coaster and to eviction. Roommate Brit had some sort of sick fascination with eating all of my food. Didn't matter what it was or who it belonged to, he would demolish it, namely my Reese's Puffs. I had tried multiple methods of reasoning with him, marking my name on the items, hiding them, even heated confrontation. He persisted, then it was time to extract vengeance. A little background of my situation in order to provide clarity to the story. I had been convicted of a crime and ended up having to endure a lot of community service hours working on an animal ranch owned by a non-profit organization that rescued abandoned animals. There was plethora of random animals ranging from peacocks to pop billy pigs that took residence within this sanctuary. All of them are less than desirable to work with and clean up after, but none of them could exceed the absolute nightmare cleverly disguised as a pack of llamas. These were mean little jerks who would find any way to torment you, be it spitting, pooping, chasing, staring or shouting. They had it out for me from the get-go. Fun fact that most would not know is that llamas like to all congregate and poop in one giant pile. This is like some form of sacred place for them and they do not like it being disturbed. Nonetheless, I was responsible for hauling shovel after shovel over the precious little nuggets into large containers and hauling them off the property. Here is where it gets interesting. I had this sort of epiphany as I dug the shovel into the almighty giant pile of llama lava. It had an interesting pillage shape and was relatively light and airy. It also had different shades of browns ranging from a creamy peanut butter color to an earthy dark chocolate tone. It looked a lot like Reese's Puffs. There were no time to waste and no hesitation. The jerk had just devoured the rest of my cereal and it was time to give him a listen in apartment living. I bought a brand new box on the way home and replaced the contents of the bag with llama poop that I had collected earlier that day in a Ziploc freezer bag. Even though I would purchase a chip clip and neatly roll it closed as if I had already enjoyed my morning ball before placing it back on the top of the fridge, the trap was set. He rolled out of bed at the usual time around 10 pm and enjoyed a quick wake and bake before he gorged himself on whatever delicious treats he could get his hands on. The sound of his bare feet on the kitchen floor. I waited anxiously in my bedroom awaiting the sound of a plastic cereal bag unraveling. He was going for it. I heard a fridge open for some milk and a drawer open for a spoon. I heard him step over to the couch and sit down. Complete silence before the almighty crunch crunch of victory echo through the apartment. And then he turned the TV on. And there was another crunch crunch. And chuckling. What the hell? How can you not realize you are eating llama poop? But I later told him on the 30th day of our eviction. What a guy. This is an old story that has been told in my family for as long as I can remember. We're talking my grandfather was told this story by his grandfather and so on. Note that this story has had close to 200 years to be embellished and twisted so take everything with a grain of salt rather than scream fake. Even if only a force of the story is true, it's still a great one. This is the story of my ancestor we will call John because that's the name I've always been told. John was a black man in America during the time when slavery was dying out. His grandparents having been brought there from Africa along with their children. John eventually was freed through some means. 
I've heard those that he paid his way out or the state he was in abolished slavery and he was free that way and found himself fighting in a civil war because he felt it was the right thing to do. During the war he became good friends with a man known as Mitch who supposedly came from money but had joined against his parents' wishes because he believed in freedom for all. Again, grain of salt. The two were in the same regiment and made it through alive. Though some relatives say Mitch lost a leg or an arm in the war. Fast forward to the end of the war and John and his new wife Mary he'd met during the war used the money he'd earned to set up a small shop on the east coast. Most common city mentioned is Boston. In a small neighborhood, the shop became successful. John, being a charming man and surprisingly savvy businessman, the neighborhood he'd set up in quickly grew as the city grew, meaning there were always customers who needed whatever it was he sold. I've heard everything from groceries to workers' tools. They lived happily and had three children together during this time, spending a decade there when suddenly, Presumably accompanied by the roar of thunder and screeches of crows, Mr. Business arrived in town. Mr. Business has apparently been on the wrong side of the war and fought quite hard to keep his slaves, but was also smart enough to sell out other racists when he saw how the tides of the war were rolling. Getting by was no losses except his free laborers. This has been the beginning of the end for his one successful plantation slash farm as all the workers he could find to replace his slaves had wanted things like pay for their service. He'd struggled to find loyal workers that didn't charge more than the absolute minimum and after a series of bad harvests had chosen to back up sell his land and head east to find a new source of income. He arrived and began buying up local businesses that seemed profitable and eventually found out about John's successful store. He was more than happy to discuss a fair price for the store, until he saw the skin color of the owner that is. 10 years is not enough time to erase a lifetime of institutionalized racism. He began harassing John to sell his rinky dink store and find a farm to work on. Do not quote me. Offering way below the actual value and when left out of the store, began trying to sabotage John's business. Getting thugs to throw rocks through windows, sabotaging deliveries, making a scene in the store. John soldiered Don through. Having grown tragically used to fighting against racism, he also had a lot of friends in the community who helped keep the store floating. Then it was that John's oldest son, who was 13 or 14 at the time, found himself getting beaten up heading home at night from his job. Again, blurry details. A wound up with a lot of scars that he'd supposedly been stuck with all his life. John had had enough, and as luck would have it, had an out. Having been contacted by his old friend Mitch, Mitch was starting up a farm slash plantation in the west, south, southwest that needed loyal workers. It offered John a foreman position, good pay, and a plot of land to live on with his family. This, dear readers, is when the revenge plan begins. John contacted Mr. Business, offering to sell at 75% what the shop was actually worth and maybe because his other businesses hadn't worked out. He took it. However, John supplied the contract and proper solicitor to make things legal. The contract basically said that after midnight of the date of signing, the shop and everything inside would transfer ownership to Mr. Business. Little did he know that the day up until midnight, the shop was having a massive clearance sale, selling everything not nailed down at ridiculous prices to a grateful neighborhood. When they closed up that night and mailed the keys to Mr. Business, there were little left to sell in the store if anything. John never found out what happened next as they left town soon after and never returned. But personally, I'd like to think that Mr. Business arrived with his workers to an empty store with no deliveries coming, screaming and crying in the mud as he realized he'd been outsmarted by a lesser species. John and his family moved to work at Mitch's farm for the rest of their lives, and John supposedly passing away in his 60s. Thank you for listening. One year ago, I was renting a house next to the most unpleasant neighbor I hope to ever experience. 
The only thing I liked about her was her cat. This freakishly adorable tabby who could grab even the most hardened criminal's heart by the balls. Every time I came home from work, he would settle up next to me for some TLC, which he never got from my neighbor. As far as I could tell, she just used the poor thing to keep away my sampling, i.e. be terrorized by her toddler grandkids on the weekends. The poor fur baby looked severely underfed and always appreciated the meals I'd leave out for him on our back porch. I have an indoor fur baby of my own, a tailless ball of energy, aptly named the Goblin. And one day he managed to escape outside. Luckily, I found him within a few hours. But by the next morning, what jumped on my lab? A Goblin. A last but a flea. And if my social butterfly cat had fleas, I was positive the next door fur baby had fleas too. Now, I already had a better history with this neighbor. In addition to being a twat rocket to her cat, she's harassed my older parents when they were helping me move in. Why? Because our U-Haul rental was blocking a dead end sidewalk in front of my house. My parents are very kind people. My mom has literally been thanked on customer service hotlines for being so sweet. And this lady was berating them needlessly for ruining the community. Ranting even longer than they had been parked. Until they eventually moved to an inconvenient and wholly unnecessary distance. Regardless of her twat rocket personality, I figured I'd warn her anyway in the best interests of her fur baby. When I knew she was at home the next day, I knocked on her front door, and when she answered, no hello, just a scowl, I started to explain that my escaped indoor cat had fleas. And so there was a good possibility that her outdoor cat also had fleas. Immediately, she parades me for letting my cat get fleas and snaps that she keeps her house very clean. Unlike me, yeah. So there is no way her cat has fleas. I just loudly sighed at her and went back home as she continued to yell. You've never even been in my house, lady. And that's not how fleas work. All week I noticed her cat scratching himself raw and felt so bad for the little guy. I wanted to give him a flea medication and a flea bath. But with my neighbor now watching me like a hawk and screeching like a banshee, if I even bit him anymore, I had to leave him alone. But I realized there was something I could do. You see, we shared the same landlord, who was very concerned about household pests, and instructed us to call him at the first sight of a bit bug, tick, and so on. I also knew that my neighbor was keeping her cat a secret from the landlord, to avoid paying the pet rent, as I'd overheard her bragging about this to a friend outside one day. So what do I do? I called up the landlord to explain the flea situation, and I made sure to add that my neighbor's cat has also been scratching like crazy. There is a pause. Did you say she has a cat? Yes. I assure him. She definitely has an indoor-outdoor cat. Turns out that my neighbor had harassed our landlord into replacing most of her carpet, due to her alleged cat allergy. I don't know why the landlord caved into this, but it wasn't cheap. And now our landlord learned that not only had mad woman lied about an allergy to score a free renovation, but she hadn't paid bed rent in more than a year. Well, an exterminator gets called, and our landlord himself shows up to oversee the whole thing. We have both received the flyer taped to our front doors, giving notice that he will be coming to both our houses on that date. But I may or may not have removed my neighbors, so she wouldn't be able to just hide evidence of her cat for a few hours. So our landlord arrives, and I listen gleefully with my window open as my neighbor tries to prevent him and the exterminator from entering. Eventually, she allows him to come inside where there is obvious evidence of a pet living there. I don't know what exactly what transpired between her and the landlord. There must be other crap stains on her record being such a not case. But a few months later, I had a new next door neighbor. And guess who mad woman purposely abandoned during the move? Her poor fur baby, who became a much loved and flea free member of our house. When I was really poor about 6 years ago, I was taking a smoke break at my dead-end full-time job and saw a fully stamped rewards card for a local spaghetti place on the ground. 
It was an entire meal, salad, pasta and a drink completely for free. No stipulations listed on the card other than presenting and exchanging it. Typically, I didn't eat lunch because I couldn't afford to. So this was an insanely good find that meant that day, for whatever reason, the universe was paying for my lunch. I picked it up and when lunchtime hit, I ran over to the diner since it was fairly close and asked for my meal to go, presenting the card. I only had a 30 minute lunch break and was paid by time punches, so it was pretty strict. The place was empty and the old woman scowled at me and told me the offer was dining only. I showed her the card and pointed out that nowhere on the card does it stay that. She scoffed and insisted it was dine in only. I thought about it for a second and since the place was dead, I asked for a table. I ordered exactly what was offered with the card. Went through the charade of waiting for her to bring it all out separately on their fancy plates, each time smiling at the same rude old woman that was now serving me. When everything was in front of me, she said if I needed anything to let her know. And I immediately requested to go boxes. And her fake hostess facade dropped entirely. She had someone else bring them out to me, leaving the card on the table. I hurriedly packed everything up, including my drink, and took it back to work to scarf down on my second break. It was the best free spaghetti I ever had. I'm a middle school teacher who speaks fluent Spanish. Thanks to growing up in the West Valley, go sons! The fact that I am bilingual has given me many opportunities, including one where a teacher in charge of an English language learner program, ELL, important acronym for later, gave me the opportunity to tutor students twice weekly, plus an additional 15 minutes per every hour worked as prep time. Okay, cool. So Mondays and Fridays I punch in 15 minutes before 2.20 during my 7th hour prep then punch out at 3.30 when the kids leave. No problem, right? Wrong. At the end of the year, I get an email saying I'm being dunked 11 and a half hours that were punched in before the end of the day. I was livid. They claimed I'm getting double paid, but I looked through everything I signed up on and didn't remember seeing any restrictions on when I was to punch in for those hours. We met in the office and the district representative had me sign this document, and she showed me the contract I signed. Nowhere did it specify when I was to punch in those hours, and I brought this to both people's attention who was present. But Federal Action Plan Office lady persisted. Just sign it, you can get double paid. Enter malicious compliance. I signed quickly, this time using my middle name, which happens to be Screw This. I happen to know the person at the district office, to Savior, who will be reviewing this paperwork and know that she will either ask me what's up or have me resign an obvious non signature. Like clockwork, I got a phone call on my seventh hour prep from Do Savior and she asked me why I signed like this and why I'm being docked. I explained my working with two new students who don't speak any English all year, and even teaching them both English all year. I explained that no one said anything all year and that I'd have made the adjustment to get paid those hours the entire school year. She says, wait a minute, you were on your prep time, right? And you're bilingual. Do you have a certificate? All answers were yes. My next paycheck was $3,500 more than my standard paycheck, coming out of the Federal Action Plans Lady's budget for Federal Action Plans. I was very confused at first. It appears that I can punch in during my contract hours if it's on my scheduled prep. And because I have an ELL endorsement, I got this endorsement working with monolingual students in the West Valley, and my direct supervisor on campus doesn't. I get paid as an ELL leader on campus, quite the stipend. So what was supposed to be a $345 deduction in pay for me turned out to be 10 times greater, as a deduction from their department paid directly to me. So looks like the Federal Action Plan lady is right. I can't get double paid. But it looks like I can get double quantuple paid. 
And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.